This episode is sponsored by Mobile Homes, America's greatest source of gilfs. Morning, hon. Uh -huh. oh, I, I called you hon and I'm naked. Uh -huh. Ah, tornadoes. God's answer to the question, hey, uh, do you think it's kind of hard to breathe in this humidity? Oh, I'm just kidding with you viewers, having a little bit of fun. I'm not going to sit here and try to sneak in little bits of passive-aggressive Christian doom saying, what do I look like, that asshole Wendigoon? <laughs> not at all. But I also can't speak to the terrifying and awesome power of tornadoes or hurricanes because, as people who've been binging my videos may know, I am from California and we don't tend to get many tornadoes out here. All I have to deal with is the occasional earthquake, just bubbling death coming up from the ground like the crudest and rudest of oil. So no, while I cannot personally relate to the fear of the storm that is approaching, provoking, I still understand the awesome and awful power of nature and how powerless we really are in its merciless grasp. And no, Mr. Trump, you silly billy, we should not try using nukes to stop hurricanes and such. Do y'all wanna make Godzilla Lord of the Four Winds? Because that's what's gonna happen. Goodness, this intro is unusually strange today. Must be all of these winds and gamer gases affecting my mind. I said nine, which I thought meant yes, but apparently nine means no. All right, all right, no more screwing around. Buckle up, folks, because just like Jello in Howard Taft's bathtub, this episode kind of goes everywhere. Shove that eager face out of your lap, put your tray in the upright position, because it's gonna be a bumpy ride. Remember last season when Hank made that wonderful gesture to let Luann stay in his den, where he tidied up her room and let her stay with the family because guess what? She was family! Uh. Well, those days are over! Hank wants his den back and for Luann to stop touching his dang underwear. And underwear seems to be on everyone's mind in this opening because Bobby goes on to do the roommate special here. Oh. <sighs> 6 a.m. and already the boy ain't right. In a similar way, this guy that comes to Hank's front door isn't right. I mean, just look at that ponytail, that carny scowl, that bright green shirt with the denim fur coat. <laughs> that is truly the poor man's Gucci. I mean, I have a jacket that's just like that, so take my little Gucci comment with a grain of salt. Anyway, this dude informs us that Luann's trailer remains bound to this realm and has some back rent due. That man then threatens to beat Hank with a wrench, to which Hank responds with a healthy nine iron retort, sending the fellow a runnin'. You know, I was gonna write, uh, I guess Hank should have kept his guns around from that last episode, but then I remembered my golden rule of critiquing, which is, would my suggestion have made this episode any better? And I want you to imagine that tone shift. Hank just rolls up to this guy, pulls up his shirt, and flashes a piece. Kinda hard to come back down from that little, uh, <laughs> adrenaline high, you know what I mean? Ugh. But please don't mind my ramblings, because when Peggy and Luann come home, Hank tells his niece the good news, that she is the owner of a piece of garbage that's been tipped over and left to rot for over a year. What a lucky gal. And what's even luckier for her is that Hank has decided to grab a wench, no, not that kind, and help untip the trailer. You know how the Egyptians untip the pyramids, don't you? With a wench, a cinder block, and 50,000 Hebrew slaves. <clears throat> You got a cinder block? I would comment on Dale's weird remark here, but I just saw something that has triggered a very special event on my channel, something that only comes around every once in a while. And so for the second time, I present to you the Gallery of Strangeness. Can't promise that'll happen too many more times, as the animation budget in King of the Hill is improving with every episode, but it is nice to see that these kind of things are still present in these early seasons. It's also nice to see that country girl Nancy is doing something other than, uh, making do with red corn. And if you know what I'm referencing, then please, I beg you, do some self-care and give yourself five dollars for the trouble of existing in this wild world. Oh, and I have to say, I find this whole overarching attitude of, like, trailers equaling garbage people to be ludicrous and offensive. I have been to some actually amazing trailer park and mobile home parks, and they are damned impressive. 
I would rather live in a mobile home park than an apartment complex. In fact, Boomhauer even lays out some of the benefits of such a living situation. Tell you what, a hundred bucks a month, man, get them hookups, get them old dang tube, tube top jiggling around everywhere and whatnot, man, do nothing but a damn old trash, man. Plus, I don't know how many apartments there are in this world that can survive a whole truck being put on top of them. Whatever else you might say about Luann's trailer, you gotta give it some credit. That thing is sturdy, as is the other trailer that Boomhauer runs into. Gosh, I love how the animators actually took the time to add the little, like, for sale sign in the window of the trailer, just to communicate that it is vacant and the guys didn't accidentally tip over a house full of people. <laughs> But now this does open things up to a very difficult kind of question, and that is, should Luann move back into her trailer? She did live there for most of her life, in squalor and with two horrible parents, so it isn't unthinkable that she would be reticent to move back in. Oh no, those mangoed colored palazzo pants that made my butt look big. Although on the other hand, she would be living on her own, in her own place, free to do as she pleases, but sometimes too much freedom can leave a person feeling adrift, and it seems like Luann is really getting something out of living with the hills. I just can't picture her fawning over Alex Trebek with her mother, or doing exercise tapes with her father. You know, the safety nets under trapeze artists can be restrictive too, but you don't hear them complaining about those nets. What I'm trying to say here is that it doesn't hurt to have someone looking out for you. So in my opinion, Luann should instead sell her trailer and put that money towards a down payment somewhere, which, you know, okay, I was gonna spoil how this whole trailer saga turns out, but let's pretend we don't know where it's going and just keep going through the episode. You're welcome. Thank Hill, how could you? What, huh? Did you see that? Did you see that? There was no transition between Peggy looking back and her turning around to face Hank. She just sort of instant transmissions over. Zoop! Yikes! <laughs> Stick that in the gallery of strangeness. With emotions running high, Hank and Peggy get into their very first true fight of the series, where neither one backs down from their side of the argument. And yes, they've had their share of tussles up until now, but this is beginning to reach into the frightening territory where it's like, okay, hold on, we're not sort of... <laughs> there's no off-ramp here, we're just sort of escalating and escalating. Ugh. When Luann decides to pack up and leave the house, Hank refuses to even engage with her a little bit, even though she's going so far as to say that Hank has been like a father to her, and how does he respond? He gives her a card for a propane discount. A lousy card. I just confess my whole, like, deep-seated feelings. Like, clearly I've got a whole, like, thing going on with my family. My... My father and mother are just going through their whole crazy thing, and here I'm saying like, hey, you know, you're not like a replacement for them, but I think of you kind of like in the role that they would be in, and just, you give me a card? What the hell? That's almost as bad as what Bobby did to her. Goodbye, Luann. I just wanted you to know that I never read your diary, even though you secretly suspected I did on June 18th, 1995. What's going on with the family in this episode? Everyone's acting all weird. Hank seems to have gone through some sort of negative character development, which is really weird for this early in the show. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at Exhibit A. Let's let's take our mind back to Season 1 and see how those scenes compare to this one. Uh, I was moving stuff around, and it seems that the room looks a little better this way. Luann is not family, she's company. Luann's not your relation. Hell, she's my wife's brother's daughter. You can't get any closer than that. Is it any wonder that Peggy is getting on his case for this? Oh sure, Peggy, I see how it is. You yell at Hank in season one for bonding with Luann, and now he's getting it for being too distant. <laughs> so what if those are two entirely different situations? I don't care. There are only two standards for you to live up to, Peggy, either yelling or not yelling, and I will unfairly compare the two. But in all seriousness, I do think that Peggy's right to get on Hank's case about this, because I would, I want to. I want to sit up there and just go, hey, Hank, what is going on with you, man? Talk to me. Just because you're uncomfortable with with having a sexy lady like Luann running around doesn't mean you can just blow her off. That's pretty low. So is it fair that Peggy gets frustrated at her husband? I would say so, but no, I do have to put a limit on this and say that that whole blockhead comment she is saying does not do much to mend fences. Tisk tisk, where is that sports counselor from last episode? I'm sure he would have a way of getting past this whole mess, maybe with a reference to the seductiveness of bowling. Now I want to read for you guys, and just you guys, verbatim exactly what Hank says to Peggy, just so we can appreciate how drawn out and overwritten this insult really is. Quote, well, speaking of hell, if I wasn't so in control of my emotions, I might be inclined to say that's the sort of place you should consider making a visit towards. <gasps> ah, truly our Orpheus has cast his Eurydice into the pits of Hades. Oh, I mean, Gas Monkey has really rustled Sasquatch's jimmies. Yes, yes, excellent reference, good job. 
I imagine this is the point where my kiddo viewers, by which I mean anyone who's under the age of 88, is going to ask me, hey, why doesn't Hank just call up Peggy and warn her of the upcoming trip to the Land of Oz? Well, Dorothy, you unrelenting gilf, it's because cell phones weren't really a thing in this futuristic age of 1999. Actually, we've had cell phones commercially available since the 70s and 80s, what you're referring to as the massive influx of smartphone technology. Hank could have still called up Peggy if they planned it out and actually been smart. Whatever, guy. With the rescue mission of saving Ashley Graham in mind, Hank gets his gear together, Bill prepares to use his army training to sacrifice himself to the tornado, and Dale and Boomhauer decide to spark our B-plot, which is really just like two scenes long. We've begun to get into that era of Dale, where he makes such a strong impression that even a little grip a gribble can feel like a whole delightful experience. As Hank and Bobby head out, we see that Hank's truck's maintenance skills crap out at the worst possible moment. What? Oh. Is it incompetence, bad luck, or a curse from Greg Daniels himself that has brought this humble fuel filter so low? But I'm actually not going to talk about the panic sweeping through the Megalomart or any comparisons to any certain pandemics because I have a serious bone to pick with this episode. I'm not sure which wires got crossed here, but it is at this point that the plot loses sight of what it was originally doing and forgets what it is set up in the first half. It treats Hank's fight with Peggy as this huge issue to be resolved, but I would say he's got a lot more to atone for with how he has behaved towards Luann. I was afraid she was gonna hug me. I was worried that she wouldn't leave and I was happy when it was over. That whole go to hell thing is such an obviously unserious and just minor insult in the grand scheme of things that I don't think it should have taken over all of Hank's concentration. And oh sure, I understand it's sort of serving as this like catch all symbol of things left unsaid and feelings left unexpressed, but it feels unnecessary anyway because Hank already has a reason to go to the trailer park and save Peggy and Luann and that's because he doesn't want him to like die, like die die. <laughs> But those problems aside, I actually really do enjoy seeing Hank and Bobby team up to go on this cute little rescue mission. As supposedly useless as Bobby is, he does serve to fill in a few skill gaps that Hank has, such as recommending that they go to the Megalomart to buy the fuel filters. Bobby isn't just along for the ride, he is an active participant. Maybe he also feels a little bad with how things were left with Peggy, as he does seem to get just a little too much enjoyment out of the cosmic irony of this predicament. You sort of told Mom to go to hell, right? And then they say on TV that in a twister, a trailer park is hell. And that's where Mom's going! But the road to hell is surprisingly backed up, with Hank and his bouncing boy constantly getting held up, first at the Megalomart with the fuel filters, and then later with the army and the blockades in the road, where Bill gets involved. Please. Okay, do you. This is where they really double down on the whole like, oh no, I've cursed my wife to hell idea, but that one never really landed for me. It feels like an unnecessarily added stake onto something that was already pretty tense as is, a real hat on a hat scenario. But then again, there is this other thing that's frustrating me, isn't there? Yeah, uh, just to put it plainly, this plot doesn't lend itself well to a lot of wacky or silly jokes, and that is because tornadoes are very serious events and can cause horrible damage to pretty much everything around them, and I think it was appropriate for them to treat this as seriously as they do, it's just that all the action has somewhat dragged on in the later third of the episode. Very like, come on, just throw a pie for God's sakes. And it seems as if my words have been echoing through the ages because thank God they actually decided to listen to me and get in this freaking amazing Bobby joke where he attempts to test one of Dale's little pet theories. Sometimes you just have to sit back and appreciate the simple joy of seeing a kid get egg on their face. It's the little things, you know. If not for Bobby's little experiment, then the only real laugh out loud moments we would have is Hank choosing to shield his nudity with the cactus and the old lady's euphemism for her experience with, uh, uh vegetables. Don't tell me that old lady's in there too! Oh, don't mind me, I've seen a barrel of pickles in my day. So I'm gonna say, like, a jar has, like, what, 80 pickles in it? So I don't even want to imagine how many a barrel of pickles would have. And no shame on her, no, 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 I would never say that. I think it's great we've got people out here who are caring for those jerkin' gherkins. I'm just saying that if she's out here appreciating those fine dills and hearty kosher comfort deals, then maybe the trailer park life ain't so bad after all. I mean, Hank's only been here for a few minutes, and he's already gained enough strength and vigor to overpower a tornado, I'm serious. 
Somebody better get an anime power scaler in here because Hank tanks an entire tornado to the face and all that happens is his clothes get pulled off. I guess tightening all those propane valves in the hyperbolic time chamber must have really done some wonders because somehow he has the finger strength to hold on to a wooden pole with just his hands. And look, I'm not saying that Hank beats Goku, but I have never seen that little monkey boy anywhere near a propane or propane accessory. He's scared of the heat! Apparently the wind speed of a class 3 tornado can get between 136 and 165 miles an hour, or that's 217 and 265 kilometers if you're some sort of metric Olympian. But whatever you call it, Hank has managed to do the impossible, break the unbreakable, and fight the power of nature itself! And he wasn't just on the outer edge of the storm either. When the wind lets up, he's actually in the eye of the storm. He was as deep in as humanly possible. God damn. Oh, and just to completely detach us from the awesomeness of this feat, as a kid, I always thought that this lady's head cloth kind of looked like Link's cap from Legend of Zelda. That has no bearing on anything though. I just thought I'd share. Uh, she's just got this and the pickle thing, okay? I wanted to give her something else instead of just that. <laughs> With the tornado gone, we can see all of the things that were weaker than Hank, from this boat to these records and even Hank's truck. Skill issue, am I right? Oh, and Luann wasn't kidding about those orange pants making her butt look big. Just look at what they're doing for Hank. God damn, I think if Luann wore those things and jumped into the air, she might actually get stuck. Maybe if she had, then the tornado would have been stopped in its tracks. Way to go, Luann! You ruined it for all of us. And this sort of aggressive attitude is how the show is going to be treating her for the next few seasons. She becomes less of a person and more of a general annoyance, one that adds flavor to Hank's furrowed brow, but otherwise can be disregarded. If I were going to use a term that has become a little too broadly used, I might say that this is where the flanderization of Luann begins, but that's not quite right either. It's more that we're being asked to laugh at her presence more than care that she's here. And oh sure, this will get resolved somewhat closer to the end of the season, but her clock is ticking. <gasps> Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> You're welcome. With all of that said though, I don't want you to walk away from this video thinking that I'm totally down about this episode. I do think that Hank's confession to Peggy and Bobby is really nice, although it is interesting how we've gone from Hank being slightly uncomfortable in expressing his love for Bobby in the pilot to now his feelings have to be dragged out of him by a literal life or death situation and only when he might actually be in the process of dying. And that's the tornado episode, everyone. It's a little weirdly paced, with a back half that's kind of wandering about until we get to that climactic finisher, but it's a pretty good end. At least I think it is. We don't see the pickle lady actually come out of the Frady hole, so... question mark? Is she okay? Did she choke on a pickle down there? Or is this just her temple of time, and we'll see her again in seven years? Hard to say. But what isn't hard to say is that this is still a really good episode, one that's a little confused, but has the right spirit. And if I may ask, what is next in our pleasure ride through season two? Look, I don't want to argue this. I I'll just take the ten dollars. Count it. It's all there. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, that gaping. You know what? No. No, I'm not going to finish that thought. He does not deserve my creativity. I will just leave it at that. He is a gaping something, that's for sure. Something that I'm going to sink my teeth into hard. But until then, we can say that this episode of King of the Hill, called Gaping Pickle Palace, has indeed been reviewed to death. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode. It's called Texas City Twister. I'm sorry. I surely am not unfond of you, Peggy. I tell you what. What kind of marriage proposal is that?